Hello, everybody. Kevin Shortell here from Note School, and of course, I'm joined by uh, Mr. Eddie Speed. Eddie, how are you? I'm great, Kevin. How are you? I'm doing excellent, thank you. And we've got a uh, excellent topic as well. This is a very, very fundamental topic that, boy, it, it comes into every realm of this industry. And by industry, I mean real estate and real estate notes. You know, understanding what the value of a note is worth, you have to know it. If you're creating your own notes, if you're buying notes, you have to know what the ingredients are. And I know, Eddie, you've been teaching this for for so long and, and, and so many different ways and, and you're really the, the industry expert in all of this and, and uh, in this presentation you put together a unique approach to this one and added some little fun aspects to it and uh, we got so much information on this that this is going to be a two-parter so we're going to get you about halfway through on this one and then we'll uh, conclude with the uh, part two on this one but uh, Eddie I've, I've been looking over the slides and, and going over everything with you you've got some interesting approaches here. So I'm going to turn it over to you to say hello and, and get us started. Well, thanks, Kevin. You know, as you said, I, you know, I spent a lot of my career really teaching a real estate investor how to make a note correctly. Um, I started that uh, with my old friend, Mr. Ken D'Angelo, that founded Homevestor. So back in the early 1990s, Ken came to me and he says, hey, man, I'm going to have a franchise and we're going to we're going to basically make seller financing part of what we do. And he said, remember with a franchise, Eddie, we, we've got to tell them the ingredients to cook a hamburger. And he said, so I don't, he said, every time that I see people have owner finance notes and they get ready to sell the notes, then they're shocked at the, what they're worth. Right, right. And I said, well, you know, Ken, and I don't know that I would have used this language back then because we've just perfected how to say things better as we progress. Right, Kevin? But, uh, I said, essentially, well, the problem is they cooked the pie wrong, right? They made the wrong note, and now they got a surprise as to what the note's worth. And so I've been doing this with in real life with real estate investors, gosh, 25 or 30 years. And uh, so when, you, you know, so along the way when we added note school, that was a big foundational principle that we really, we went, really went on is like, understanding what drives the value of a note. And so, as you said, Kevin, it's the most foundational principles. It's not a well understood subject. And um, and uh, that's why we focus on it a lot. And that's why we put so much emphasis in this that we can't even do it all in one webinar. It's it's, it's part one and two. So I'm right, going to progress not, with it. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, so it, going back to your analogy there of cooking the pie, it's it's the ingredients, but it's also the right amount of ingredients, and, and that's what I think a lot of people miss out on too. They just don't see how to put the whole thing together, and if they don't put it together right, uh, it's not going to come out that well <laughs> well for them, obviously. Uh, so that's a great analogy here. So uh, go ahead. So you've got to put this together in a little different format for us. So I, I thought it would be fun. You know, we'll, we'll make it a little bit like a game show, and I I guess appropriately said, we'll call it the note game show. But we'll make it like we'll make it like a game show, and and you know, a little steal a little bit of uh, some creativity from you know from old Jeopardy. And uh, but here's the here's what I really think is interesting, and that is, can you win a game when you don't know the rules? And that's the ultimate question. I think really a lot of people that look at notes, they don't really truly get to how the industry has dissected the rules of the game. And so they can't really fairly play the game because they don't even know what the rules are. Do you think they learn the rules and they just kind of copycat what, what other people have done or they heard somebody did it this way and then they just go, well, I, that must be the right way? You know, that's a good question. There's a, there's a lot of real estate training that has some dimension to seller financing. And, uh, but once again, when they train seller financing, the problem is they've never traded notes in the secondary market. So they don't know what a note's worth, right? They're speculating at a creative technique in selling a property and creating a note, but they've never taken it to the other level. You know, I mean, our executive team seriously has bought over two and a half billion dollars in owner finance notes. We know what a note's worth. We know what it's worth when we buy it. We know what it's worth when we sell it. So our unique note trading 
background has really changed, I think, the effectiveness of what we train. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that we don't think that some real estate trainer doesn't know other things, but in all fairness, they don't know notes the way we know notes. And so we're just saying, you know, respectfully, you guys scoot out of the way a little bit. Let us train people how to create notes because we know how they're going to pay and we know how they're going to trade in the secondary market, whether you're buying or selling. And that's what I think we have passionately done for a long time. I mean, we, there's a lot of different dimensions to notes, but I think this, as you said, Kevin, this is a foundational principle that if you really don't get this, you don't have, you don't have the really all that you need to start. Exactly. So what are these magic rules, Mr. Shortail? What well, in the world are these magic rules? <laughs> now these are these rules are going to be the guidelines or things that you have to look at or things that um, are the ingredients. Going back to your analogy, right? Yeah, basically, if you if you if you drew out a org chart and you said every time you influence the value of a note, can you touch one of these six variables? And the answer is yes. With these six variables. You can price any real estate note out there. So what's the first ingredient? First ingredient is the buyer. It's the guy that owes the money. Um, we are buying non-bankable notes, right? That's why we buy notes at a discount. They're not Fannie Mae loans. They're not Freddie Mac. They're not FHA. They're non-bankable. And, and, and so it's interesting, Kevin, as we progress, people a lot of times make the presumption every note has bad credit. Now, I've bought a lot of notes where the people had injured credit, but there were redeeming factors, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about it. But the number one variable that influences the value of a note is the guy that owes the money and what his qualifications are. Right, so the that quality of buyer. the buyer, and then what you're saying is the quality of the buyer is where everything starts because you have to look at that if you're doing uh, lending somebody money, obviously, if you're creating your own note or if you've purchased one, but also the secondary market is going to look at that as well. So if you're in the mode of creating this, you've got to keep that in mind that you want to create a very good quality note on, on the one hand. If you're buying the notes, obviously, that's something you're going to look at, but you're saying also that there are things that can counterweigh uh, the credit score and that sort of thing of of the buyer. You can't you can't make injured credit totally go away, but you can diminish injured credit, and you diminish injured credit by other strong redeeming factors about the loan, which will unfold. All right. So, so one of those could be the collateral, then, huh? Yeah. To go back to it, I I used to say it like this, Kevin. I guess I should still say it this way, huh? I used to say it like this, and that is. Uh, some people can borrow money at the bank, some people have to go to the finance company to borrow money, and some people have to b borrow money at the pawn shop. Gotcha. And all of them can get a loan with the right other characteristics, but each time you do that, the value of the loan is probably going to you know, be affected a little bit, or the, 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 what the interest it earns, or the yield on your investment, or whatever you want to call it. And obviously, secondly, was the collateral, which is the property itself. And and um, we generally kind of describe our business as working class real estate or whatever. But what people don't may not know is that I bought a note on about everything you can imagine, junkyard to a mansion, and uh, and other kinds of collateral. Lots of I bought thousands of notes on dirt. Thousands of notes on land tracks. I'm 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 a, I love land, as you know, and mm -hmm. I've had really good luck financing, you know, land with owner financing and and also buying notes. So there's a lot of different kinds of collateral. You, we'll talk more about residential loans over this presentation, but the, but as but the, it, that's a wider band. The buyer's equity, and uh, really that just means really how long they've been paying. Have they paid down the loan a lot? Or did they pay a lot of money up front down payment? Either one, we'll kind of refer to that as skin in the game, right? Right, the old skin in the game, yep. So the next one is the terms of the loan. And uh, the terms of the loan are going to be the interest rate and how long it's payable. And you'll see as we progress, that's going to have a dramatic difference on what a, how a loan could be priced. 
And then uh, the pay history. Pay history is necessary, Kevin, when there's other weak factors. Mm -hmm. If I buy, if I bought a, a, a note on a nice house with the buyer making 20% down and the buyer had an 800 credit score, do you really need to season that note before you could buy it? I mean, do you really have to see a two-year pay history or a one-year pay history? Right, with a score that high, no. And, and so once again, the pay history is kind of the the lever bar to, you know, sh let me buy a loan that otherwise had some imperfections that I would normally be scared of the investment, but wait a minute, I'm now okay with it because they've proven they'll pay. Right, and that's what some folks on uh, on the webinar today might uh, hear that term seasoning. Correct. Seasoning of a note, pay history. It's uh, you'll hear me use another expression today, Kevin. I'll say is the loan baked. <laughs> All right, stay along with the uh, with the pie analogy here. I got gotcha. <laughs> you. And, uh, and 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 meaning that has it seasoned long enough that it's a predictable result. Gotcha. With, a, with a good enough pay history. Even with poor credit, even if the collateral's less than perfect, the pay history overrides these other unredeeming factors. So we, right. we, we're going to beat this up a lot. But this is, as you said, we 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 approach this differently. We think there's a different way to kind of have people have can have a better memory of doing it. That's why we came up with the game show ideas because it's a little easier to remember kind of the rules of the game than it is just somebody spewing a bunch of facts to you. Right. Paperwork's a big deal, Kevin. Paperwork's a big deal. Um, you know, when you buy a real estate loan, you want it to be legal. <laughs> I've heard. Yeah, really. It sounds like a good start, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people create notes, and uh, there's some legal issues with them. And, there's a lot, and sadly, there's a lot of notes that we see that we won't price because there's legal issues issues with it we don't, we don't want to deal with so uh, yeah well as an investor I mean you always have to think in terms of risk and reward right I mean you've got to look at what am I buying here how was it created what's my potential risk what's my potential reward in all of this and really the ingredients you've uh, the rules that as you will that you've laid out for us here again it's 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 all of these but it's also the combination of all of them that's going to come up to that I guess that sum total of uh, risk and reward that you can kind of balance out right that's it in fact, it's funny you say that because uh, that's what we're going to talk about in these two sessions is we're going to talk about, you know, this this combination of risk and reward and when is an 8% yield deserved on a loan versus a 12 versus a 14. And for the most part, Kevin, a lot of people, both real estate investors and other people that do this, they, they're they're just sort of throwing a dart and we want to kind of take that mystery away from it and say this isn't a dart throwing contest this is a these are definable industry standards that our team has dealt with for a very long time and uh, and and there's a reason when that these loans are priced the way they're priced so speaking of the team there's the team that was at uh, that was at Note Expo last fall and uh, November of yeah, each year. First, first weekend in November, we have a, a Note trade show called Note Expo, and we had about 600 folks there last year, and we think it will be bigger and even better this year. So we have made it the marketplace for Note. So there's our good-looking team. and. Um, so Kevin, you and I put, place a lot of emphasis on the fact that what Note School is really selling is experience. Oh, and, no question. Yeah. And our executive team has bought three billion dollars in discounted notes. So we place a very high emphasis on the experience and and what that means. Uh, that we when we're telling you something, we're telling you something that we have known and lived over a long period of time. So that's just sort of emphasis of that and always happy to get to, uh, there are a lot of these people that, uh, the note school people see you and Kevin, they see us all the time, but they don't <laughs> see everybody. So we're always glad to show them some other faces. Exactly. All right. So we are going to talk about 
two kinds of notes. We're going to talk about uh, performing notes and we're going to talk about non-performing notes. We're going to talk about non-performing notes for just a little bit to start. And we're going to talk about the fact that non-performing notes trade at about 20 to 70 cents on the dollar. And we're just going to kind of quickly go through that. And, and, uh, and then uh, the most of this training, both part one and part two, is going to be about the performing side. And it can be a lot more of a passive investment. So uh, obviously, if you're buying non-performing notes, it's a pretty active investment. You, you certainly got to have some, some savvy. But a lot of people don't know the rules of even buying the passive investments, which are performing notes, and that's obviously what we're trying to do. But we're gonna we're gonna start out with uh, with non-performing, and that won't take us terribly long to get through that, and then we're gonna go to a deep dive here. So let's just talk about how do I price a loan and these six characteristics here, and we're gonna apply apply that to this concept. Kevin, we said that the buyer was probably the most single most initial important ingredient of a note, right? Right, because they're the ones responsible to make those payments. All right, well, if we're buying a non-performing note, then guess what? They're the ones responsible for not making the payments. <laughs> they're not making payments, you're right. <laughs> so, so you could, uh, you could, you could kind of throw your calculator away, you know, in, in the sense that, you know, we you don't need to run yields on something that when they're not paying, right? right? So the cash flow isn't quite as important because, well, sorry, they're not paying. Now, I'm not saying that's totally true, and as we progress into it, we 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 teach a lot of theory on how to modify loans and get them paying again and stuff like that. But we sure. we did this a little bit to have some fun with you because we're once again we're trying to create some memorization with you. So we got a loan that's in default, Kevin, and 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 the property that we're buying the note on very likely may be what you would refer, her, hear me refer to as a non-bankable property. Mm -hmm. That's based upon the, the, the price value, the condition of the property, that sort of thing. Well, the value add non-performing notes for the most part are going to be sub $100,000 houses. Okay. Mm -hmm. The hedge funds are buying the bigger non-performing notes, larger loans on, lar on, on, on nicer properties. They're just paying a price that it's not really going to work. So you got a loan that's not paying. The property is non-bankable, meaning that it's not a two hundred and fifty or three hundred and fifty thousand dollar house. And then secondly, they probably owe more than the property's worth, Kevin. Oh yeah, we had a lot of that in Florida where we're underwater. Well, uh, upside down, I think we say in Florida, underwater is probably not the best uh, way to put it here in Florida, but <laughs> in other words, they, they owe more than the house is worth, you bet. <laughs> All right, so, and then the, the, the other variable is uh, the pay history. As, as we said, they're in default, so they can't really rely on the pay history. And so here is the big punchline, Kevin, of all of these variables that we're throwing up on the non-performing note side. Let me tell you one, this next one is a big one. It's a valid lien. Right. So now you start to see where the old paperwork thing becomes pretty critical, right? Am I buying right. a first? Am I buying a second? Is there taxes in front of me? You know, is it an enforceable lien? You know, it, it, is it, it is all of the things that, that I need to, if I have to enforce my right on this note and foreclose or whatever I have to legally do to say, yes, I'm a lien holder, then the valid lien factor comes in. So we just kind of, we're just, this is all common sense, but we're just trying to cr create a, a thought pattern is when you're thinking about the industry, you just can kind of weld this in your mind. Why these six characteristics apply to any kind of note, a paying note, a note that's not paying. So the question is, what do you pay for a non-performing note? So here's our house, right? And I'm going to stretch along the side there, Kevin, and I'll say we're going to come up with an as-is value. Current right? condition. Mm -hmm. Current condition, what it's worth right now. And then we're going to draw a line across, and then we're going to say what percentage of the as-is value of this house can I live with. Okay? Now, sometimes, Kevin, that's 35%. And sometimes that's 55%, right? 
right? It's not the same number every time. Right. Each deal is different. So this is the whole deep dive I know that you do with guys and teaching them this whole due diligence at these classes and stuff. And this is a this is more than a paragraph, right? <laughs> this is this this the answer to this question takes more than a paragraph. Right. So the answer is at the end of the day, the punchline is that's what you pay for the note. Mm -hmm. So the cost of the note is really a percentage of the value of the underlying collateral. And depending on occupied, not occupied, uh, you know, back taxes, you know, do you have to secure it? Are you, can you see that you've got to go spend, uh, you know, a, a more lengthy time in foreclosure? And is there some, all of these things are going to influence the decision, not just the price point of the house. And in the note buying business, if you're taking notes right now, this is this to this point, other than the six variables that describe a note, this one is something that everybody's got to write down because this is the basis of the note buying business. And it's called investment to value ratio. And basically it's your investment in the note compared to the value of the collateral. ITV. And it's different from loan to value, because remember, we're buying notes at a deep discount. Kevin, they could owe 120% of what this house is worth, and I'm still in it at 50% of what the house is worth. Yeah, I don't want to buy this uh, based on how much they owe, especially going back to the last slide where we said that many of these homes, they owe more what, than what the house is worth, because i got to think in terms of if I'm going to end up with, which I could happen to uh, end up with this property, Where's my uh, where's my line? You know, where's my uh, where's my percentage? Exactly what you're talking about. How much do I want to be all in on this property when I got to fall back on the value of it? Yeah. All right. So so once again, just to kind of help you kind of think through this, I say that the business is nothing more than we're a pawn shop for real estate. Because if you think about it, you, you, Kevin, you've seen that show about those guys out there in Las Vegas with the pawn oh, shop? Yeah. All the time. That is a smart cat. That guy is smart. Because he people bring weird stuff in there all the time and he backs into it and figures out what it's worth. And it's so when he breaks down the value the percentage he picks is usually how the, the more difficult it's going to be to sell, the longer he has to hold it, what it's going to take for him to be able to sell it. So you got to go take it to the shop and have them rebuild it. All those things are just exactly what we do when we look at a non-forming note. Everything, literally. Yeah, he's got all the rules in place that, like we're showing here, that he applies to his business. And you're right, it does come down to that... Um, Price and value equation, really. That's what he's doing here, right? He's coming up with a value, and then they start setting the price, right? Exactly. So um, non-performing notes, if we take the as-is value, we usually start out at about, oh, 50%, okay? About half of the value. And then that number will slide down to, in, in other cases, Kevin, that could be as low as 30%. So generally... The general answer is, Eddie, what do you guys pay for non-performing notes? And the answer is, we pay as high as 50% of the value of the of property, and sometimes we'll pay as low as 30% of the value of the property. And, Kevin, I will tell you this, and we're not going to try to beat this lesson up today, but the the other factor that I think I put that I think Note School does a great job is we show people creative techniques of how to sell these properties and make them bring retail. Because sometimes when you look at the comps and the multiple listing service with the realtors, all you got is cash sales, and that may not be retail. So we can sometimes even make these numbers better than we're telling you. Yeah, so we've seen that in, in plenty of BPOs our, ourselves, and I, I've read BPOs where the uh, real estate agent is almost apologizing that these are the only comps that I can use in this area where they know 
it's worth more money than that. But because of the, the, the comps that they have and, and, and the cash sales, that uh, they come in uh, at a lower amount. Right. So, so we gave you a really, really short lesson of buying non-performing notes because that really wasn't the main emphasis of our presentation today. But it does kind of tie in with investment to value performing notes. And so it was worth us spending just a few minutes to talk about kind of the big picture. But fairly quickly here, we're going to move Mr. Shortail into the other side of the business. So, we, so obviously non-performing is an active side of the business. Now let's talk about the performing side of the business. And what do these loans sell for? Well, it depends on how good it is. There are loans that are paying. You typically might buy them at a discount. And those loans might bring 60 to 90% of the amount of the loan. And for the next good while today, and even on part two, we're going to take a pretty long, deep dive at the difference in what you pay for a note. Because I have found that I've sold thousands of notes to private investors, literally thousands, and they all, Kevin, the first thing the investor asked me is, what does it cost and what's my yield, right? Right, right. And, and those are punchline questions. But without a base of knowledge, the punchline questions honestly doesn't make any sense. So that's what we're going to do today is take a take a take a good long look at this and talk about what that means. This is an this is the passive side of the business, and uh, but there's some there's some knowledge that's needed to effectively buy notes, even if you're going to do it passively. If you ask me, Kevin, would I rather own a note, particularly a performing note, or a, or a rental property? I'm just telling you, there, there, there's no, I mean, a rental property is not even in the same class as good as owning this note. So it's a great, it's a great investment. You just got to understand what you're investing in. Once you do that, it can be super passive and not a lot of work. So where do you get the money to do it? Well, I am a big proponent of retirement accounts, okay? Uh, because I hear all these IRA administration companies tell us uh, we would rather our, oh, see our clients own a note than virtually any other investment they could make. So it's a pretty solid investment for a whole lot of money looking for a home right now. Kevin, if the self-directed retirement account industry is a $120, $100 billion industry, it's generally perceived that about a third of that money in self-directed retirement account companies is uninvested today, which means, sadly, it's sitting in cash. Yeah, that's a crazy, crazy number, and they're getting a lot better. It is interesting because I've been to some of these events that these companies uh, have to educate these investors that there's alternatives to the stock market. Everybody thinks IRAs, 401ks, all just stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, and boy, you want to see some eyes light up in a room when they start to understand the, the power where they can have, as you said, in this passive type of in investment where they can really grow these things through their through their IRAs is pretty pretty remarkable. Yeah. So so building a retirement account, you can basically make your your any form of your retirement account your own little bank, and and we're not going to talk a huge amount about all of the strategies that we could do today in that regard, but we're just saying a lot of the money that's sourced to buy this business is from there, and there are definitely some phenomenal leveraging techniques. So as you progress and, and learn more and more and more about notes, I think you're naturally going to want to earn learn a lot of this, and, and uh, you get the fun time, Kevin, of teaching the this uh, class, this advanced note class we have, and you get, you take a long, deep dive on this subject, don't you? Yeah, absolutely, because even though it's a more passive investment, as you were saying, it does come down to that buying decision, and you have to know if it's a good buy or not. You have to know if you're getting a good buy, you want to avoid the bad buy, and that's what's going to bring us back full circle uh, on these uh, six redeeming factors, right? I mean, that's where we're heading on this. You can look at the, the broken notes, so to speak, and that's, I think, what you, you were saying there with the non-performing being more active and the uh, performing notes. You know, we still have to know 
fundamentally, is this a good buy or not, and why? Yeah. So once again, we'll this this lesson is about buying notes and what you pay. We're just emphasizing that 40% of all the notes that we sell every year is sold with is funded by self-direct retirement account money. That's that's to me that screams. So uh, obviously that's why we talk about that. There's a lot to be said about the Roth IRA account and understanding when it's the most powerful. So these are all things that you need to make sure that you are completely aware of what this means and and what it can do for you. And uh, once again, we're not we're mentioning this today because it's it's worth mentioning. But we're not taking a deep dive at this today. But we do. Uh, in training go into a lot of this and why this is important. So let's go back to the old note game, okay, the old note game show. And and let's let's look here, Kevin, and let's talk about the question that we're asked a million times a year, which is good buyer or not, right? Well, right. When is it a good deal? And so let's take a dive at this. Uh, these are the six variables that we're going to beat up a, a lot right? These six variables that we're going to really beat up a lot, the buyer, the collateral, the buyer's equity, terms of the loan, pay history, and uh, and the paperwork securing the loan. And so what we always try to do, Kevin, in this process is we have to measure the redeeming factors. Yeah, in other words, what's working towards the value of it? Yeah, you want to know why? Because the truth of the matter is, we buy imperfect notes. I mean, that's the truth. If we were, if we were doing a perfect loan, we'd be buying an FHA loan that's earning three and a half or four percent interest, right? We buy imperfect notes, but but what I will say is, Kevin, they're perfect enough. Right. So you're saying the imperfection is really what creates a a, a better opportunity, right? Yeah, I mean, otherwise the banks and Wall Street they they would just take this business away from us. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this is these are these are small investments and 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 the perfectly suited for retirement accounts and investors kind of spreading their their money over some deals. Uh, but they're gonna have some imperfections, and we have to know they have some imperfections, and because of that, uh, we gotta. We got to we got to learn when they're perfect enough. Now sometimes they're not perfect enough yet, Kevin. Right. And that's we're going to talk about that as we progress. But just just to kind of we're building we're kind of building a, the framework of our house here. So we got a sales price of a house, and you got a down payment, and you got a first mortgage. Okay. Let's say the buyer pays five percent down. Right. Not a big down payment. Right. Right. And then let's say that the buyers loan is 95% of the value. Now let's throw a monkey wrench in there, Kevin, and let me say, oh, by the way, Kevin, oh, this guy, he's got injured credit. Hmm. Okay, he's, uh, as you've fondly heard me say before, Mr. and Mrs. combined credit score is 750. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you can do the math there and figure out why that's <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so obviously the, the 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 down payment is a weak factor, right? And and the and and the buyer's injured credit is a weak factor. So on the surface, Kevin, what do we got here? Yeah, so we're trying to look at the redeeming factors and the non-redeeming factors, and you would have to say that boy, those are kind of working uh, working against the value of this note. Now, now we're getting the concept of why you have to weigh this together, okay? Because on the surface, this is not a strong deal, but it may get to be a strong deal, okay? And so I like to think in terms of this idea, Kevin, and that is you have to know the science of the art, but beyond that, you have to know the art. Hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, a lot of people think because when they learn how to run a financial calculator, Kevin, that makes them a note buyer. 
it makes them understand the science of the math, which I'm not saying isn't important, right? You and I both love teaching math. Oh, yeah. And and uh, and it's fun to teach somebody to use a calculator, and we've done that excessively over the years, and we think we've come up with some really creative ways to explain it where people can remember it and see it and all that stuff. But I can tell you something, Kevin. You and I could spend five days in a room with people doing nothing but teaching them the math. It still doesn't make them a note buyer. Yeah, they don't have a feel for it. Yeah, yeah what, what what am I running numbers on? Mm-hmm. So, so, so that's it. That's really where we're going with that saying. So let's start out with old number one here, Kevin. Num factor number one, right? The buyer, right? And and here's what I here's what I want to know, Kevin. Verifiable income, debt to income ratio, credit, pay history, previous residence, job stability. How's all this sound? Yeah, nice little checklist there. Good. And and you know what? You're doing it the right way. That's you would have to look at that. I I would think if you're renting property, wouldn't you do the same thing? I mean, this is uh, this is something you really just have to make sure that every every box is checked in that. What what if I'm buying a note and they haven't done all this? Oh boy. So they 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 cook the pie. Going back to your analogy there, and and we're buying it as is. You got it. There you go. That's the that's the that is the imperfect world, Mr. Shortail, that we live in. Mm -hmm. So so as you progress, you're going to see that that I make buy decisions when I can gather enough information that that gives me a comfort. Sometimes people have already made some decisions that that they didn't ask my permission; they just did it, right? And then I got to figure out whether I can live with it. And that's why it's more than a science. It becomes an art. Okay, keep moving here. We're, we're, we're getting somewhere. These are, Trust me, we're throwing up some good walls to, for a foundation for our house here, right? Yeah, they, they say in real estate appraisal also that uh, appraising, they say the same exact verbiage, appraising is not a science, it's an art. And obviously... You would have to know, along with the buyer, going back to your uh, six rules there, is about the collateral. So what do we need to know about the collateral? All right, so collateral is, uh, you know, it, 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 what's the saleability, okay? What, who's going to live in this house, Kevin? Who's going to occupy it? You know, or, or who is the buyer? Is it a California investor? Is it a guy that works at the plant and his wife works at the insurance company? In other words, those are all the things that back into the saleability of the asset, okay? Uh, is the property non-bankable? Now, we make non-bankable sound kind of like bad or substandard. You know, right now, Kevin, most properties, most houses that sell for less than 80 grand are non-bankable. Right, and the the non-bankable could be a result of the borrower, but you're saying it could also be a result of something else. I was recently in, uh, I, I travel out uh, in out west a lot. I travel all over a lot, but I travel out west a lot. I was in Portland hanging out with, you know, people that can't imagine what an $80,000 house could look like, particularly a $55,000 house. And the guy says, well, I'm, I'm, one, I'm, I'm, I'm at a reception. The guy says, I live in Eugene, Oregon, and any house in Eugene sells for $250,000. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, but you take that house and you drop it in Dayton, Ohio, in a nice neighborhood, and it sells for fifty-five dollars or sixty. dollars And he said, you know what? I didn't think about that, but you're right. Yep. And I said, I, we teach people to buy notes all over, and you can use these strategies wherever. I said, but a lot of times we buy notes in these markets because they're so underserved. They're undervalued because of this lack of financing. So just understand non-bankable doesn't mean bad. It just means you register it in your, in your decision. This is a big deal, Kevin, the neighborhood. And... Uh, I buy. I will sometimes buy a note in a high crime neighborhood, but the guy's been paying for years, right? Mm -hmm. He's proven he lives there and can live with it. I don't know that Miss Martha, my wife, would go let me move in there. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. She wouldn't go over there with me. How about that? <laughs> but, but 
the, the, the neighborhood is a factor and that's obviously something that we take in a deep dive and due diligence as the neighborhood. The condition of the property and you know we buy notes on used houses um, and some of them are some houses out there are well used. Kevin would you say that? They've, they've been lived in yes. <laughs> they've been out in the weather yes. <laughs> So condition obviously is a big factor and then the next thing is is what is the collateral? Is it single family? Is it land? Is it commercial? So you know those are all things that become part of the scale that we're drawing here. So um, oh here's a great question Kevin. Can a realtor sell it? Uh -huh. And you might find this shocking but we we buy a lot of notes on a lot of property that selling it through a realtor is not not the way to do it. Not the way to go. Not, I'm not disrespecting their profession, it's uh -huh. just not what they're good at. Right. Um, because uh, you know we might sell a house that we load with a tenant and sell it to a California investor or we might sell a house you know to a consumer and offer owner financing you know and so the realtor in a lower in no income house neighborhood, they might just say, well, we just put on MLS and the first guy comes along, we sell it, usually pays cash. Well, that don't sound like retail to me. Right. And it comes back to also that non-bankability that you're talking about where it's not the consumer, but it's the property, either by value or, or unique type of property. No doubt about it. And and one and one thing you'll find interesting, and I, I'm really on a campaign of drawing awareness to this, is when we're selling inexpensive property, don't presume you're going to sell to somebody that's got bad credit because nobody that has the best credit can get bank financing in that price range. Why don't you sell to the best people in the market, right? The most deserving buyer. Exactly. You know, Absolutely. That's a, I, I can get on my soapbox over that, right? <laughs> this right. is what I would refer to, Kevin, as non-bankable collateral. Mm -hmm. And it all of those things, all all of these properties are non-bankable collateral. You scared of these, Kevin? These are the, these are the opportunities. I mean, that's what we have to have to look at here. They're non-bankable, but again, understanding that non-bankable means imperfect. And going back to your statement a while back, there we buy imperfect notes. That's where we make the yields. That's where our opportunity is. You know where I got these pictures, Mr. Shortail? Probably from uh, some of our assets, I'm guessing. Exactly, they come out of due diligence <laughs> files. So, so you're asking me, do I do I know that these are the kind of loans that we may end up buying notes on? I'm darn certain. All right. Now, mm -hmm. Kevin. Now, Kevin. Some properties are non-bankable, and I may not can live with the collateral. Really? Just, so that's what? I, I'm just saying. <laughs> It's a high rise. What are you what are you, what are you talking about there? <laughs> oh, just a little humor with you guys. Just a little humor. That is pretty clever, isn't it? <laughs> All right. So these are bankable collateral and these are notes that you know these are also notes that we ended up buying along the way. I think one of those is clip art because the the the, the picture of the property looked just like it except it was so so um uh, fuzzy that I went with the I had, I had uh, my lady use the uh, my graphic arts lady use the better picture but it, that these did, we bought notes on stuff like this but by the yeah. way these mm -hmm. notes are more expensive right right yeah. and your and your experience though too as, as long as you've been around in this 35 plus years now um, seller financing on on everything today right I mean Properties you never used to see seller financing on. It's it's really grown and it's it's everywhere. Would you agree? I had a guy I had a guy in my office a week or so ago, and he is selling brand new brick houses here in Dallas Fort Worth, and the average price is about one hundred and seventy five thousand, and they're offering owner financing on them. Huh. And he's selling them because he, you know, has a clientele that has. Um, 
you know, they may not necessarily get a Fannie Mae loan, but they come with a big, big, big down payment, and he provides home ownership for people that may have had a little injured credit, but they deserve a second chance, and particularly the fact they're coming with a big down payment. Hmm. Well, big down payment's one of those other other issues. I think that's your next one coming up, right? It's funny you say that. <laughs> So the, the next thing that we'll talk about is the buyer's equity, and we, you'll hear us refer to this commonly as skin in the game, and that could either be cash equity, meaning uh, that what they paid when they bought it, or it could be appreciated equity. In other words, you know, they, they bought paid for years, and now the house is worth a lot more than what they owe on the loan. Mm -hmm. So um, the, then the other question is always, uh, can they sell it if needed? Boy, you know, Kevin, not many people think of that one. You're right. If the buyer got in trouble, could they sell it if needed? And I'm going to tell you something, Kevin. We've done some pretty amazing things helping a customer that got transferred with a job, um, helping a customer uh, that lives in a working class property that has paid us well and has really done good and they say I've got to move for these reasons and we say well let us help you and let's help employ some strategies to go sell the house so that that you could you know maybe find somebody that could assume your loan or or you know all kind of different things that might be done and once again we're we're trying to help that borrower you know in, in a situation because maybe just going to the local realtor is maybe not the best choice, but the more equity they have in the deal, the more likely they can that they can sell it. Right. All right, so here is what is commonly referred to, Mr. Shortail, as rate and term. And yeah, obviously, how long are they paying back and what the what the interest is, huh? Exactly. What's the interest rate on the note and how long is how long is it payable? And and is there a balloon? Okay. Now if the loan has a balloon, which basically means you know that it's amortized over 20 years but in five years now it's due and payable all the principal due plus any back interest and then the first thing we're going to say today is with Dodd-Frank is that enforceable so some balloons we see are enforceable some balloons that we see are not enforceable so that's kind of a legal question that we get to there and then secondly here's the big one Kevin so when the balloon comes due, what's going to happen? Yeah, can they come up with the money to pay it off? Yeah, I mean, can they refine and take you out? So it shocks me that not everybody in the note buying business doesn't ask these questions, but <laughs> the more the more experienced ones do. Now, let's just say it that way, okay? Sure. All right, keep them moving here. So note values. Here's, here's a couple of principles. If you're taking notes, this is a good time to write something down, okay? The shorter the term, the more it's worth. Redeeming quality. Redeeming quality. The shorter the term, if all variables are equal, the shorter the term, the more it's worth. The longer the term, the less it's worth. Okay? Now, we're going to prove this theory in a minute, but this is a core principle. So the longer the term of a note, the more likely it is out it is to have a greater discount. All right. So let's show this, Kevin. Let's go through here and let's unveil a note. Okay. So we have. Whoops. Well, I'm looking for that magic thing here, Mr. Shortail. It's not working with me. Lost my animation on that one. Um, so the financial. Calculator. Yeah, that was my little financial calculator. Gotcha. So, so, uh, but that's all right. We can we can unroll it here. So let's just say that this note, if you look on the kind of the right section of your screen, it's a hundred thousand um, dollars is the note, and it's written at six percent interest. The payment is about six hundred a month, actually five ninety nine, payable over thirty years. So Kevin, this is a thirty year. 6% note, and in the world of seller financing, when I might have some other unredeeming factors, that note could have a pretty good discount in it. So right, that's because the investor would have to wait so long to get all of their money back, right? And it, and it only earns 6% interest. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Take the same note. Now it's a hundred thousand at six percent, but it's payable literally over five years, which makes their payment nineteen hundred bucks a month. All right. So the total payback is almost half of what the 30-year total payback is. But mathematically, Kevin, this loan would be sold at a modest discount. Okay? So let me go through this again. I multiplied the payments over the life of the loan, which is amazingly what everybody wants to know, right? How much is the total payback? Okay? In this scenario, a 6% loan is um, the same 6% note, the same $100,000, but mathematically, if that loan were fully paid back in five years, you would buy that note at a much less discount than if you bought the identical note, but it was payable over 30 years. Now, Kevin, the elephant in the middle of the room is, can they afford the 1900 bucks a month, right? Right. So we understand that this is where common sense comes in. It isn't just punching a calculator. You can learn the mechanics of punching a calculator and figuring out how to create the most valuable note, but it isn't going to do any good if you don't use the common sense and make sure that the guy can afford the payment that the note calls for. So this is, these are all thought processes as we progress and learn more and more and more about this business, we're going to, we're going to play this card back a lot down the road. And we're going to say, we learned a, we learned a, a good bit about the science, but we're always going to remember the art because in my mind, Kevin, you can transcend the art into just a lot of sense, common sense decisions based on knowledge of variables. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does, and just so we can clarify with, with everybody, faced with those two notes, and again, you, you were assuming everything else was equal, it's just all you did was have one that paid back over 60 months and one that was over 300 uh, in 60 months, and you're putting here modest discount and heavy discount, but of course, we could go back and calculate and figure out what that discount was and how much based upon the, the, the financial numbers, right? And guess what we're going to do in part two? There you go. We're gonna do it. So we're gonna we're gonna take we're gonna we're gonna build on this. We've built a lot of foundational principles in this part one. So we're gonna build on this, and then we're gonna draw some mathematical conclusions in part two, so that you can get a sense of what we're saying. So just to go back real quick, Kevin, uh, this is the 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 longer term note. The total payback is two hundred and fifteen thousand dollars, right? Two hundred fifteen thousand eight thirty eight on a hundred thousand six percent payable over thirty years, and we'd say that note would have a heavier discount because it takes thirty years to go earn the interest on the note plus, you know, all the money back. Right. So what you're saying? Oh, sorry. Before you get to that one, so what you're saying is, if you were to buy this note and that pie, I'm going to go back to your analogy there. That pie has already been cooked, and you're buying this note, so you're coming in. You would look at this through the eyes and say, "Well, I would need to come in at a heavier discount here." Based actually, on this term. My, actually, my unfortunately, my calculator would. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Because versus the same. We're going to do this. We're going to run some of this math and show you when I run the calculator, and it, it just is what the number is. Mm -hmm. So as we progress, we're going to like take the, every analogy that we've drawn here in part one. We're going to apply that to part two to specific examples, and so you'll see this. It's a uh, it's it's a learning it's it's a learning process to kind of show me a deal, but you once again you got to yes you have to understand the science you have to understand foundational principles that drive the business. Now applying the science is 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 this art form that Kevin and I keep alluding to. Mm -hmm. All right, so once again I just kind of roll back a little bit. This is your thirty. This is your five year note, and the discount would be much less, much modest, more modest discount for that reason. Right, and of course, if we have somebody brand new on uh, on that, the discount we're talking about is paying less than the face value of that note, less than the hundred thousand. That's right. All right, All right so maybe we, got tell, we got a part two a coming. All right, and uh, let's talk about it. So, so basically, in this today, 
we have covered uh, buyer collateral, buyer's equity in terms of the loan, right? Now we're going to apply some pricing to this. All of these variables that we've mentioned, these first four that we've really covered, we're going to then go back and put pricing numbers based on this. All right, so we got more to say about these four variables, but there's two variables, Kevin, we haven't even busted open yet, okay? And that is the pay history and how, what kind of pay history we need to see on what kind of note. In other words, when is the pie cooked enough, right? When is it paid long enough that I can do it? And then we're going to talk about the paperwork side. And Kevin, the big punchline to part two is going to be this one. What's uh, my, everybody, everybody wants to know the yield, right? What's my yield? And Kevin, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you this. Your yield is relevant to your tolerance. Mm -hmm. And your tolerance is influenced by your knowledge. Say that one more time, Mike, but I didn't mean to talk over you there. That your tolerance is influenced by your knowledge. Mm -hmm. So what you and I might buy might not fit everybody in this business. So there is, uh, as you can see, we got a lot to say on part two because we are, we've, we've now definitely opened it up definitely progressed with, you know, one of the most important variables of this business, which is breaking this business down in the six characteristics that influence the value of a note. And now we, now we paste it in on top of that, Kevin, what I think is an equally important question, and that is, what's my yield and, and do I fit this type of investment? So it'll be fun. It'll be, a, it'll be great. It'll be uh, very informative as well. And uh, I know everybody wants to get into uh, to the math. And, and Eddie, give us your quick definition of yield in case that's a new term for everybody. Well, yield is just simply your interest on your investment per year. There you go. So if you're interested in how to, how to calculate that and how all of these other factors come into play, that's exactly what we're going to do on part two. We will see you there.